Good evening. I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at North Beaver Baptist Church. And I'm glad you're joining with us. And it's good for you to see me. I can't see you, but you hopefully you can see me. And, and we're looking forward to a good time of Bible study. Hope you've had a good day. Uh, the Lord's been in charge. And even if we have problems and difficulties, He's there with us and goes through it with us. And, and uh, we're just uh, thanking the Lord for all He's done for us this day. Uh, we want to remind you that uh, we're still in the uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 protocol. And, and hopefully in a couple of weeks, looks like things maybe will begin to open up. And we'll be announcing some uh, maybe some changes in our service. Of course, we have been uh, uh, televising uh, or putting online, streaming on uh, live our Sunday morning and Wednesday night services for quite a while. So it really wasn't nothing new to us other than the fact that we uh, haven't been meeting, uh, you know, physically here. But hopefully uh, very soon that will be changing. We certainly look forward to that. God's designed us and designed the church to worship together. And uh, we need that fellowship. And we certainly miss it. I hope everybody's doing well. I remind you, if, you uh, if you're a member of our church or even if you are not and have some needs and some difficulties and want to speak to someone, I'll be sure and call our, one of our deacons or call myself. And, uh, you know, we've got a website, uh, northbeaverbaptist.org. Uh, and then we also have a Facebook page that you're looking at now. So uh, we're pretty easy to get a hold of. And uh, we want to help you and, and, and be a blessing to you if we... If you have a need, and, uh, and we possibly can. So we just uh, just invite you to do that. Thank you for being with us tonight. I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 13. We're going to be finishing up John chapter 13. Uh, we're not finishing up uh, the upper room uh, because the next few chapters, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, uh, we will still be in the upper room and looking at four uh, chapters that deal with the last sermon. Uh, John 14 through John 17 is Jesus' last sermon, last teaching time with the disciples. Uh, when we get over to chapter 18 and verse 1, it says uh, that the disciples, uh, Jesus and the disciples, uh, get up and they go out of the upper room and go over the brook Kidron into the garden. And, of course, we know what uh, maybe was some of the things that happened there. So we're going to be looking at these uh, chapters over the next couple of weeks and, because I believe there's, some, there's just some tremendous teaching. Jesus is, uh, as we said before, uh, these messages, uh, these are the last uh, 24 hours, 48 hours of Jesus' earthly ministry and, and the time uh, last uh, day, if you will, or day and a half that Jesus is spending with his disciples, the men who have been with him for three years, and the men he chose to train and to be become the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. So uh, he's uh, doing some of the most intense uh, and intimate uh, teaching that he has done with the disciples. And we're going to look at, begin reading tonight, the last part uh, of verse uh, chapter uh, 13, and we'll begin with verse 31. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now, and continue to pray for all those in our church who are uh, having uh, problems. Uh, uh, continue to pray for David and, and uh, Connor as they recover from their strokes. Both are doing well, at home doing well, taking therapy, and and coming right along, we praise the Lord for that. Continue to remember the Dent family as uh, Rick, uh, Rick's mom and dad, uh, is both, both now are uh, uh, diagnosed with cancer, and, uh, and they're going through that, but we believe God's able. Uh, cancer uh, can be beat, especially when the Lord gets a hold of it. So continue to pray for them, pray for all our, pray for one another, and pray for me. I need your prayers. And, and uh, continue to pray for everything we're getting ready to do. Uh, by the way, I want to remind you now, next, next Sunday night, uh, we will start uh, our, our revival service. And I've never, never conducted an online Bible uh, revival 
But uh, we're going to do it. And uh, we're going to preach the Word of God and have special music and, and uh, we're going to have special prayer and, and just focus on the Word of God. Reverend Joe Sturgill, uh, a friend of mine, pastors uh, in uh, Moravian Falls Baptist Church in Moravian Falls, North Carolina, just off the mountain here in Wilkes County. And looking forward to uh, him being here and, and uh, his folks, I'm sure, be joining in with us nightly. So we're kind of having a joint revival. Uh, but you pray for Brother Joe as God prepares you and uh, puts some messages on our heart. I'm looking forward uh, to being preached to by the Word of God and looking forward to him coming. So uh, I believe God's in this and looking forward to see what God does. So you tune in and invite others to tune in, just like a normal revival, other than you don't have to, you know, come down here and sit. You can sit at home and have popcorn or anything you want. That's going to be a pretty neat revival. Uh, but uh, let's pray for that. That God will bless, the souls will be saved, lives will be changed, God's people will be encouraged and strengthened, challenged to walk a deeper and closer walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go to the Lord and pray together. And by the way, while you're watching, if you want to, if you want to add comments and you want to um, uh, add comments to uh, uh, the, the the site there as you're watching, and maybe you got prayer requests or you want people to pray, other people can see it. This is a Wonderful technology. Uh, and others who are tuning in can see it and, and they can pray as we're going along. So I invite you to do that. And uh, that'll just uh, help us uh, to know what's going on out there. Now let's go to the Lord and pray again. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. What good and gracious and merciful God you are. We're so unworthy of your love and your grace and your mercy. Um, God, we just thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. We pray for your blessings upon the teaching. I ask you, Lord, to touch my throat and help uh, my voice to last and help us, Lord, to follow your leadership. We pray for those that are lost and undone that they may come to know you as Lord and Savior. And we pray for those that are struggling tonight for whatever reason. It may be physical, it may be a sickness of some type, like uh, Rick's mom and dad and Brother Dave and Connor and, and others. And uh, some shut-ins. Of course, we've got a lot of shut-ins now. A lot of people are locked up at home and, and can't get out or don't want to get out and maybe don't need to get out at this time. But we do pray for this uh, disease that it will go away and uh, that we can get people back to work. And, and uh, we pray for the ones that have lost loved ones to this. And you'd comfort them and help them. Be with our leaders as I make decisions about these things. I know there's a, a lot of division, a lot of controversy out there about this, but uh, bottom line is... Uh, there are leaders, and, and they're human beings, and they make mistakes. And we need to pray for them. God will lift them up. And, and God, we repent of the sins of this nation that we can get back to uh, 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 your favor and grace being upon this country. Now, bless each one that's watching tonight. And help me as I teach. And we give you all the praise and honor and the glory. For it is worthy. You are worthy of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, tonight we're going to be looking at John chapter 13, beginning with verse 31. We'll go ahead and read our scripture, and I believe I'm reading from the, the infallible inerrant word of God. What I mean when I say that is, I believe every word of God is true. Uh, I believe there's no error in it. Uh, I, I believe it, and God said my word is, is pure, and, and I believe every word of God is true. So as we read the scripture tonight, look at verse 31. Therefore... Uh, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say unto you. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, and what he's talking about is the fact that we love one another, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, 
why I cannot not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Question. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice or three times. So tonight we're looking at uh, the last little discourse here before we get into this great sermon. Uh, John chapter 14 through John chapter 17 is one sermon. And uh, it's, uh, we're going to be looking at it in the days and weeks to come. And, but uh, Jesus is now is finishing it up. Now, they remember now, in the way of review, we, they gathered together in the upper room. These are events in the upper room. Uh, they, they ate uh, a meal, a Passover meal. They, he instituted the Lord's Supper. Uh, he washed their feet uh, as an example to them of humility and serv servitude to one another. And they've been dealing with some other things. And now... We'll get down to verse 31. Uh, he says, therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now. Uh, you know, sometimes we read these words like that in the Bible and really pass over them and say, well, uh, Jesus is just using that word now kind of as, a, as just a, a, a general word like we do sometimes. But really, when he used it this way, and he uses it also... Um, uh, down in another verse we'll look at in just a minute when he says now uh, he is, is setting a time uh, so when he says now here uh, it's like okay you know set your clocks we're getting ready to start something here uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reference on his part to saying this is a this is a special time this is an ordained time if you will this is a time that God has set uh, to begin something or do something. And, you know, uh, we, we all have schedules that we try to keep uh, at work and church and other things. But uh, a lot of times our, our life is not scheduled that way. Well, this is something God had on the, this is something God had on the calendar right here. Uh, you know, I, I believe with all my heart that when God sat down at his desk, he had, uh, he had the day that Jesus was born on the calendar uh, he had the, the day uh, that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. There are just some special things in the life of the Lord. And, of course, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, God had that on the calendar. But I believe he had this on the calendar too. And here's the reason why. Jesus says, now, at this moment, this is the beginning of something. This is a particular and peculiar uh, time frame in the plan uh, of God. Now is the Son of Man glorified. Uh, he's, he's designating the fact that when, when Judas went out, that's what it means in verse 31, therefore when he was gone out, it was Judas. Remember, uh, the, uh, he, he told him that once one of them sitting with me here is going to uh, uh, betray me. Uh, the plans have been made to betray me. And one is going to do that. Uh, and he said to uh, one of the disciples asked him, I think Peter asked, and then, of course, John, close to him, I asked him, said, who will it be? He said, well, the one that I hand the salt to. And that was a common way of eating. They had a common bowl of uh, probably some kind of uh, uh, vegetable soup and probably had some meat in it. And they would sop, uh, sop the, uh, up the broth with the bread. And, uh, and, uh, and so he did that. He said, the one that receives a sop from me. He's the one that's going to do this. one that's going to betray me. So Jesus knew who it was. Jesus knew what he was going to do. You know, we, we've talked about this before. Uh, Jesus, when he came to the earth, he did lay aside some of his uh, divine privileges. Uh, I've heard people say, well, when Jesus came to the earth, he laid aside his divinity. Absolutely not. He did not lay aside his divinity. Uh, he could not lay aside his divinity. That's his nature. That's his holy nature. Now, he did lay aside some privileges that he, he had uh, in heaven uh, down here. And one of them uh, was uh, later on, he's going to allow himself, uh, he's going to allow himself to be taken uh, by the temple guards and, and uh, you know, uh, arrested. And they, they couldn't do that if, it, if he didn't want them to do that. And so he lays aside some things. And, 
And uh, so he, he says here now when uh, he knew Judas, what, what Judas was going to do. And, uh, you know, we, were, we don't want to misunderstood Judas's place in this because we talked about it last week. Uh, Judas was chosen as much uh, to be in this group of men as the others were. Jesus said, have I not chose you? And one of you is a devil. So when he chose them, he knew he was a devil. When he chose him, he knew what he was going to do. And this is one of the hardest things for us to understand, how that Jesus could choose his own betrayer. But you need to understand God's plan. Uh, and, and God's plan was for Judas to do that. And when Judas did it here, it was a signal, uh, not so much to Jesus, not certainly not to God, uh, that, uh, you know, this, this is, now it's, this thing is going to begin. But when he said, now is the Son of Man glorified, he said, now begins my passion. Now begins uh, God's redemptive plan. Now uh, begins all the events that are going to lead up to my death, burial, and resurrection uh, and, uh, and fulfilling God's redemptive plan. Uh, I, I wrote out from my own understanding, Jesus declares here uh, the cross and God's resulting redemptive plan as the supreme glorification of God. He goes on and he says, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. What does it mean to glorify? Well, the word glory means praise or honor or recognition of superiority. And so when Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified, he says, now is beginning the plan. You see, uh, his, his betrayal, uh, his arrest, all the things I kind of went down and tried to uh, write down in my own mind what, this, what will transpire now from this point. So now is when Judas left to go betray him. He went to the, uh, to the uh, temple and they got the temple guards and, and just as he had promised for the 30 pieces of silver, he leads them back to the garden and we'll you know, be talking about that in the, in the days and weeks to come. And, uh, and he betrays him. He, he goes in and, and he says, uh, you know, he says, Master, and kisses Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm, you know, uh, betrayed by a kiss, by a friend, you know. So uh, here, these are the events that are taking place. Jesus knew God's plan. Jesus knew that the departure of Judas to betray him would set in motion the events of his atonement and his finishing of the work that God had called him to do. Uh, he would be betrayed. He would be arrested. He would be subject to illegal and unfair trials. He would be denied. He would be ridiculed. He would be beaten. He would be accused. He would be humiliated. He would be condemned. He would be uh, flogged with the, with the uh, whip. Uh, he would be pierced. He would be crowned with thorns. He would be nailed to a cross. He would die on that cross. He would be buried uh, but rise again the third day according to the scriptures and then ascend to heaven. That was God's plan. But it had to begin that the, the initial event, step one, was when Jesus handed him the salt. Can you imagine that? Jesus says, I, I know the one that's going to uh, betray me. I know the one that, that I've chosen to be that instrument that uh, the world would use, Satan would use, to uh, start this plan of rejecting me and me finally ending up on the cross. When he handed Judas that piece of bread sopped with the, with the broth of whatever they were eating, Jesus knew that that was the moment. Uh, Jesus was very aware of the time frame of his ministry as he followed the leadership of the Father you know, on several occasions. Uh, you know, it, it used that terminology in the gospel uh, that they came for him, but he was able, the disciples was able to lead him away or he was able to sneak away because it was not yet his time. Jesus had a timetable. He had a, he had a, uh, a plan and God had a plan. Uh, I remember the very first public miracle Jesus did, recording the Bible in John chapter 2. 
in the wedding at Canaan. You remember his, his own mother came to him and said, uh, you know, they, they run out of wine. And, and that was uh, evidently a very social faux pas back in that day. And uh, uh, said, uh, you know, and, and Jesus turned to her. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with coming uh, to Jesus and ask for things. The Bible says if we ask anything, he said, if you ask anything in my name, I shall do it unto you. Jesus is ready, willing, and able to answer prayer. But at this particular moment, Jesus wanted his mother and all those around him and us who are reading this Bible several thousand years later, he wanted us to understand and all understand that he did things according to God the Father's timetable. You know, Jesus was very quick all through his ministry to say, I only speak what the Father tells me to speak. I only do what the Father tells me to do. And he said in John chapter 2, when his mother came to him and said, they run out of wine, what can you do? And he turned to her and said, he said, my time has not yet come. He said, it's just, uh, you need to understand there, everything. In other words, what he was saying was this. He was saying, God's got this on the calendar. You know, she may have not been, but 15 minutes early. But she was running 15 minutes early, according to the calendar of God. And Jesus was saying, listen, if, if, if it's God's will, it's on the calendar. Uh, we've got a date for it. We've got a time. We've got a place. And it's going to happen. And sure enough, uh, a little bit later at the party there, the wedding reception, uh, he turned uh, 750 gallons of, of water into wine. I don't believe it was fermented wine. I believe it was good, clean grape juice. That was the top of the line for them. And, and so, uh, but it, it reminds us that Jesus did everything according to God's time. Now when he says, here, go back to verse 31, I hope you got your Bibles there in front of you, and maybe an ink pen and a pad that you can jot down notes, because uh, I'll tell you, uh, I've been doing this for quite a long time, uh, over four decades, around four decades, and every now and then I'll say something worth writing down. Uh, but hopefully it's uh, something that uh, I got from the Word of God, and, and that's what I try to preach. But he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Now five times in these two scriptures, he uses either the word glorified three times, and glorified two times. And, and so you say, well, wow, is this just a... Is this one of those word grievances? I mean, what's going on here? No, uh, he's, he's talking about the fact, and as we said before, to glorify means to ascribe the honor and the praise due unto somebody. You know, if, you, if a person in the Olympic Games wins the 100-yard dash, they bring them up on the podium and give them the Olympic medal and glorify them, and so to speak, honor them, give them the honor of its due. They won the race. They need to be honored. Well, Jesus is saying, uh, now that this, uh, this uh, plan of salvation is beginning to roll on, Judas is the, kicks it off by going and betraying me, and he says, so now is the Son of Man glorified. That means uh, that uh, what he does on the cross uh, is, is a glorifying thing. It's a thing that should be praiseworthy. It's a thing that people are going to look on and, and, and say, uh, give him the glory for. We do it every Sunday. Uh, uh, you know, it's wherever you are, somewhere or another, here or there, we sing his praises. And we sing about the cross. So we're glorifying the plan of God. We're glorifying what Jesus did. We're glorifying the fact that he died upon the cross and was betrayed and and, and uh, beaten and arrested and subject to all those things. That's his glo that glorifies him. Why? Because, you know, we make a lot of people look at and say, oh, I heard somebody say one time, they look at the life of Jesus, they watch one of the movies about the death of Jesus Christ, and oh, what a tragedy. Well, no, it's not a tragedy. It, it would be a tragedy if it, had, if it had accomplished nothing. It would be a tragedy if it was not a part of God's fulfilled plan for the salvation of millions and millions down to the ages and possibly billions. We don't know. But uh, you see what, what makes it something, in other words, when, when Jesus is saying, I believe my cross is going to glorify me. I believe I, I need to be glorified because of what I'm going to do on the cross. 
Well, I believe the Father needs to be glorified because of this wonderful plan whereby he, he laid out this plan of redemption. Uh, and so he's saying, uh, now is God glorified in him? And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. So basically he's saying, both of us are going to get the glory for this because, you know, they're both involved. God the Father sent the Son. The Son. Why, do we, why do we glorify why do we glorify God the Father for as far as redemption? We glorify him because the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that who shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, we glorify God and say, God, you're, you're a merciful, loving God to send your son Jesus to die upon the cross and go through this plan. And then we turn to Christ and say, well, what, what, why, why do we glorify him in salvation? He was the one who was willing, became obedient unto death, according to Philippians 2, even the death of the cross, and died for our sins. I was just reading uh, in my devotional again this week in, in, that, in that great uh, verse there in Romans chapter 5, uh, God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We ought to give Christ the glory for dying for us. We ought to give God the glory for sending him. We ought to give Christ the glory for being willing to take our sin dead on him. And that's why he's talking about uh, the, and when he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, he's saying, now starts the process, if you will. Now starts the days, now starts the events that will end up by God providing a way of salvation for millions of souls. Think about it. When we all get to heaven someday, and all this stuff is done down here, and we turn to the we turn to the throne, and millions of people, maybe billions of people, will lit, raise their raise their hands and hearts and lips to praise God and glorify Him for what? Because He made a way to heaven. Because he made a way to escape the, uh, the pangs of death. Because he was willing to send his son and die for man's sin so we might have eternal life. That, if, we, if, we can't get, if we can't get excited and glorify God because of that. In other words, uh, you know, the Bible tells us to glorify God and, and say good things about him and praise him as we look out into the heavens. And uh, how wonderful it is to look into the stars and all the galaxies and look out in this beautiful countryside and mountainsides that we live in and give God the glory and say, man, God, you, this is a beautiful world, but oh, how so much more should we glorify him for his finished work of salvation. You know, there's two songs in heaven. And why do we sing songs to ascribe glory? Why do we sing songs about God to say he deserves the glory? And there's two songs in heaven. There's a song of creation that everything can sing. And then there's a song of redemption who the Bible says only the saints can sing. Two songs. One glorifies God for his created work. One glorifies God for his salvation work. So that's what he's talking about here. You know, uh, he's going to talk more. He's going to use this word glorify a lot as we get on into these uh, uh, into these chapters in this sermon. So anyway, he's, he declares uh, the cross, his cross, and God's cross, and God's redemptive plan uh, as, an, as the object of ultimate, supreme glorification of God. And remember, glorifying God means to simply give him his due, give him his praise, give him his glory, give him his honor. And that's what men should do. And when they don't do it, they're out of the will of God. So let's move on. So Christ's fulfillment of the Father's plan is, is what he's talking about when he declares the cross as the glorification of God. And now let's move on and we'll look at the, the next verse here. Well, that was 31 and 30, uh, 31 32. And so we're going to move to 33 and 34 and 35. And here is where, first of all, in, in verse 33, uh, let's read that together. John chapter 13, verse 33. Uh, he said, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and, I, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. 
said, man, I want to say to you, now let's stop right there and look at that verse. Now Jesus says, and this gets, uh, this gets Peter riled up again. And we're going to talk about Peter at the end here because this is where Jesus predicts his, uh, his denial that he's going to deny him three times. And bless the heart, Peter. I'm, I'm glad Peter's in the Bible because when I read about some of the things, I've got 12 things that Jesus or Peter was messed up on. We'll, we'll share that real quickly before we get done tonight. Now, or, or basically 12, I don't know, mistakes he made and where he was, he was either out of context, out of the will of God, too soon, too late, a lot of things. And, and that's probably not all of them. Those are just ones Bible recorded. And uh, it makes me feel better because uh, now I understand that God does, God's not looking for perfect people to serve him. If you're out there tonight and you say, well, I can't serve God because, you know, I mess up, I make mistakes. I, and, and by the way, everybody does. Everybody falters. Everybody fails. Everybody trips up sometimes. Everybody makes mistakes. Preachers make mistakes. Deacons make mistakes. Sunday school teachers make mistakes. Everybody, people of the choir, even the choir members make mistakes sometimes because we're all human. We're flawed. But thank God Jesus is forgiving and he can restore us. Now I kind of got over in my last point and that's Roger's fault. We'll blame that on Roger tonight. But Jesus predicts his uh, his soon departure. Look at verse 33. He says, little children, uh, this is the only, this is interesting, this is the only time Jesus uses this uh, title or this vernacular when he talks to his disciples. In the whole of the Gospels, little children. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he says, my little children, it, it, is a, it is a term of affection. It is a term of understanding where they are spiritually, that, you know, they're, they're still immature. These, these disciples have been with the Lord Jesus for three years, and they've learned a lot. But they still have a long way to go. And folks, it, you know, it, it takes a lot. It, uh, learning to follow Jesus Christ is a lifelong process. There's no magic point where you say, Oh, I finally reached it. Now I'm perfect. I know everything in the Bible. I'll never make a mistake. I'm just God's gift to religion. That doesn't that, that, that exist. Listen, uh, the day you draw your last breath, the day you, you cross over into the promised land will be the day, and I'm going to say this, I don't think it's the day you're going to quit growing. I think we're going to grow in the Lord in heaven. I really believe that. But I, what I mean as far as down here, you're never going to reach a state of sinless perfection. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach it. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you say you don't have any sin in your life, the only person that's fool enough to believe that is you. And that's what the Bible says. So anyway, in verse 33, he says, little children, and he's talking about the fact, it's a term of affection. He's had these men for three years. They've been through a lot. Uh, you know, they've been up and down. And uh, he, Jesus loves them. He just said in the, in the chapter before, he loved them to the end. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves his disciples. He loves his followers. He loves the, the children of God, the people of the church. You know, the people of the church take a beating from the world. And I know, listen, world, if you're out there, I know the world's out there, but I don't know if they're listening. But, but I want you to understand, as a child of God, Jesus loves you, and he loves the church. Does the church always do right? Has the church never failed? No. But, you know, I, I get a little tired of every time I get on Facebook or some other kind of social thing or turn the TV on or pick up a, a printed page, and some little nitwit out there is bad-mouthing the church. Now, I believe there's legitimate things that the church needs to bear up to and own up to. But boy, I tell you what, all the, you know, the, this, this thing of just browbeating the church, you better remember who the church is. It's Jesus who's right. Yep. He loves us. He knows we fail. You better be careful. So anyway, I'm ranting here a little bit, that's okay. Now, going back to verse 33, he says, 
listen, he said in verse 33, uh, yet in a little while I'm with you. I'm, I'm going to be here with you for just a little bit. And that's a little while. Little. Okay? What he's talking about here, he's trying to get them ready for the, for the garden experience. Uh, he's trying to get them ready for when that moment comes when uh, the temple guards come and get him with Judas and take him away. You know, and, uh, he, he says two things here. I'm going to be with you for a little bit. And you'll, you'll, but then, then guess what? I'll be taken away and you shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I'll say to you. Now, that reference to when he said to the Jews, where I go, you cannot come, that was in regards to a salvation experience. Where they were spiritually, they were lost, and he was saying, you can't go where I go because you're not saved. And now when he turns to the disciples here, and says, you can't go where I go, uh, so, so now you cannot come, so now I say unto you, he says, whither I go, you cannot go, so now I say to you. But the idea here is this, that the disciples can't go in the sense that they can't walk the road to the cross. There's only one person that can go to the cross. There was the only person, because when he says, yet in a little while you won't see me, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I'll be gone you, and you won't be able to go. You won't, won't really know where I'm at. And what he's talking about is is when he proceeds into the plan of the Father and, and, and is uh, betrayed and, and, and arrested and beaten and all the things that he goes through, there's only one person that can do that. Now the Bible says we're to take up the cross and follow him. But the cross that we take up Jesus carried it first. And he was the only one that could carry it. He's the only one that could carry it. And by the way, he was the only one that would carry it. You remember what he said? John and other places. He said, per adventure, well, he said it in Romans chapter 5 in my, in my uh, devotional study this week. He said, per adventure would a good man some even dare to die. But God forgave his love towards him while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's giving the idea, there's not, a, there's not a lot of people lining up out there to die for you, especially if you fail them or sin. Mm -hmm. Jesus was the only one that <clears throat> could carry the cross. He's the only one that should carry the cross. He's the only one that would carry the cross. And that's what he's talking about here. Where I'm going now, you can't go. Remember when he asked Peter and James and John, they were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. You remember that? Don't you know, in the, we saw it in, I think it was in Matthew chapter 9 or, and then later on, we saw it in John 13. And uh, so it happened all during his ministry. They were just constantly bickering about, well, I'm the best, I'm the finest, I'm the greatest. I should sit beside Jesus in the kingdom. And he turned to him one time and he said, are you willing, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Mm -hmm. They didn't know what, had no idea, Brother Roger, what they were talking about. True. Had no idea. I mean, they just, I, I, I guarantee you, they had that deer in the headlight look. <laughs> what? <laughs> we have no idea what you're talking about. He said, it's simple. Can you drink out of the cup that I'm going to drink? Oh, yeah, yeah. What they didn't know was they were saying, we can uh, accept the full weight of the punishment of sin upon him, upon us, just like you can. See, that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Nobody could go where Jesus was getting ready to go. He was getting ready to walk, uh, kind of like that movie, he's getting ready to walk the green mile. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what he was talking about here. Not that they couldn't go to heaven, because they could go to heaven and were going to heaven if they knew Jesus as Savior. But they couldn't go where he was getting ready to go. He's trying to prepare them. So he, uh, you know, he predicts his own departure. He says, I'm getting ready to go. I'm going somewhere. You won't be able to come. You won't know where I'm at uh, I, because it's a place that's prepared and, and uh, set aside for me and me alone. I thought about this and Jesus, you know, there were some things we'll talk a little bit later on as we talk about the garden. But you remember he gets over there in the garden and they're praying and then that group comes out and, and, uh, and of course Peter, this is one of the things that we'll talk about with him he, you know, uh, he, he draws out his sword and cuts Malchus's ear off 
one of the servants of the, uh, in the temple there. Jesus heals it back. And Jesus said this. You know, here's the thing. Uh, he's, he's going where he's going. And he's going to willfully give up his life. And, P and Jesus asked Peter, uh, put your sword up. Don't you understand that at any given moment, I could call six legions of angels. A legion is 12,000. So he said, at any moment, I could snap my fingers and say, come on, boys, and 72,000 angels will show up. Mm. I'm going to tell you in just a minute what 72,000 angels can do according to the Word of God. But let's move on. Jesus predicts his soon departure here, trying to get them ready to understand he was going to the cross. He was going to finish God's plan. He was going uh, to die. And they couldn't go. They couldn't do that. Even if they did, it wouldn't do no good because they're not the Messiah. They're not the Son of God. So the next thing we want to look at, verses 34 and 35. He not only, he not only tells them of his departure, but he tells them about their new distinctive. I like this. Verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. My this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, when ye have love, or if ye have her, the big old if her, a lot of ifs in the Bible. If means the ball's in your court. You've got to make a decision. He's not saying when you love one another. He's saying if you love one another, some things are going to happen. If we love one another, the love we have for one another is going to become so distinctive and so visual and so palatable that the world will be able to associate it with the love of Jesus. That's what that says. But if we don't, they're not going to make the connection. See what he said in verse 35? By this, what? Loving one another. Shall all men know that ye are my disciples? A disciple is a follower, a learner. Somebody that's trying to imitate and become like their leader. You know, in, in the late 70s there, um, they had a group called the Unification Church. I don't even know. I guess they're still going, but Reverend Sun Young Moon. And, you know, the, the kids were getting involved in that. They were putting on these robes and, and shaving their heads. And well, everybody started calling them Moonies. Why did they call them Moonies? Because they were following Reverend Sun Young Moon. Why did they call us Christians? Because we're following Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, Jesus says, what is really going to be something that will make the world say, man, that, that guy's like Jesus. He says, the distinctive, what's really going to make us stick out like a sore thumb uh, is the fact that we have such a love for one another. And not just a normal, everyday, run of the meal love. Nothing wrong with those things, but gee, he said, here's the key. How do we know it's a superior type love? How do we know that it's a giving love, a sacrificial love, a, a love that goes above and beyond normal human love? Because he said, as I have loved you. Jesus loved in a special way. I wrote down some of the characteristics of Jesus' love quite quickly. The Bible says his love is unconditional. He loves you no matter where you are, who you are, how ugly you are, how bad you smell, doesn't matter. He loves you. Unconditional. I know it's hard to believe. We put so many conditions on our love. Well, if that person boats my way, or if that person drives the same car that I do, that person pulls the same football team, that person does this, that person does that, that person, you know, kowtows to all my wants and Desire that I'm going to love him. That ain't Jesus' love. Sorry. That's world love. World love is conditional. Jesus' love is not only unconditional, it's unending. Now, Jesus, here's the thing about Jesus' love. It never started, it's always been, it never started anywhere. But it also never ends anywhere. Now, I know that's hard to believe. Remember, Jesus is eternal. We're, we're temporal, he's eternal. Now, we're eternal now. Because we're saved. 
Jesus' love was never preferential. It was unpreferential. That means he didn't choose out little groups and say, them some people I'm going to love. They drive the same cars I do. They live in the same neighborhoods. They have uh, uh, similar, it's called demographics. I was taught it for years. And, oh, demographics this and demographics that. I'm going to tell you something. God's got one different demographic. All are sinners. And I love them all. What he's saying is this. Jesus loved everybody, no matter what kind of neighborhood he came from, no matter what kind of clothes they wear, no matter what kind of job they have, title they have, or non-title that they have. And that's not the way humans look. I know. But that's what God loves. It's unpreferential. And then it's unearned. You can't do anything to earn Jesus' love. I've heard people say, how can I make Jesus love me? What? <laughs> I can't miss you. He already loves you. He loved you before you was born. He loved you as ugly and mean as you are. He loves you. It's unearned. You can't do anything to earn the love of Jesus. You can't do, to, do anything to, to earn more of the love of Jesus. I, I, I'm a little, I, 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 I don't know if that's the songs, but sometimes songs, there's one of those songs that said, uh, that Jesus would love me more. Now, Jesus has no more or no less. It's just the same and it's constant. Okay? You say, well, what if I send to Mark? He still loves you. Well, if I don't send to Mark, he still loves you. You see, it don't change. It's unchanging. Unchanging love. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, if you love this way as I have loved you, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. You're going to be different than the rest of the world. People are going to notice that you are my disciple. Why? Because you're following my leadership and replicating my lifestyle. They're not going to call you a little Jesus if you're just loving normal like everybody else loves. But if you love like him, they're going to say, wow, that guy's a disciple of Jesus Christ. This superior, unique, Wonderful love would then become the distinctive of the church of Jesus Christ. Loving one another is what makes us look like Jesus. Real quickly, Jesus, we got to get the going here. I tell you, this preacher's long waiting tonight. <laughs> Jesus predicts Peter's denial. That's our final point tonight. The last so called event. Now, when I say 14, 15, 16, 17 are a sermon, that's an event in itself. But it's not like, oh, he's talking to this, he's talking to that, or here's what this person says, or Judas goes on. All those you can see are kind of actions, events. So Jesus says this about the distinctive aspect of his love and through us for one another. He says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because you have love one for another. And Peter's been sitting over there for a long time. Now, the only thing he said so far is he asked who would be the one that would be betrayed. You know, he, he and the others, it says that they asked that. So he's been kind of quiet. And if I know anything about Peter and his being Peter, his, his Peterness, if you know about that, he's, he's got something to say. Peter's not always right, he's not always wrong, but he's never in doubt. <laughs> yeah, he's got something that's up. You know people like that. I know people like that. I may be people like that. But in verse 36, look what it says. John chapter 13 and verse 36. Look at your Bible. Wake up. Look at your Bible. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, and you know, now I know the Lord, Lord knows everything, but the Lord Jesus must have. I think by now, he must say, every time Peter says, Lord, he must say, oh no. <laughs> what now? <laughs> oh, what in the world is he going to come out with now? And sure enough, Lord, whither goest thou? See, remember, he started out by saying, I'm getting ready to go somewhere that you can't go. So Peter, you know, Peter's going to buck that. You know, you just know that in the nature of Peter. He said, wait a minute. 
You can't go where I can't go. I, I, you, don't, you don't understand. Peter's already said in Matthew and, uh, and, uh, and another uh, one of the narratives, he said these other disciples or goofballs may fail you, but I won't. You know, he's already put himself up above everybody else. He's headed for a fall. Okay? <laughs> like he most of the time is. He said, Where would I go? Jesus answered him and said, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me. Now, here's the key, folks. Here's that other word now. You can't follow me now. Okay? He's saying, at this particular point, I'm about to go along because I'm going to the cross. Mm. Now, look. But thou shalt follow me afterwards. Amen. Peter, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to serve me. And after I come out of the grave, after I resurrect, after we get the church on the ground, you're going to be, you can follow me then. i got a job for you. Okay? You see what he's saying? Now look at verse 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, he just told you, Peter. And look <laughs> what he says. Look, he just said it. Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? You can't because Jesus just said now. You can't. Have you ever argued with God? <laughs> Believe me. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, okay? You can argue with God like riding a bicycle with no chain on it. You'll expend a lot of energy, but you will go nowhere. <laughs> okay? Peter, he just said you can't go now. And he said, why can't I follow you now? I, and then he makes this statement. Now, Peter really jumps it up here. He said, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. So here's Peter's boast. And you know, his, his presumptuousness and a little bit of pride here. He's been wanting to sit beside Jesus. Remember, he was one of the ones that was involved in that. So he said, I'll lay down my life. And he's already said, like I said, another narrative, I believe it was in Matthew. And it may have been in Mark, a little too, I'm sure. But he said, he said, he said, all others may fail you. Boy, when you start setting yourself up like that, you are getting ready for a fall. Okay? The next time you want to say, uh, no matter what everybody else does in the church, I'm going to do it right and never fail, uh, let me know so I can get my lawn chair ready to sit and watch. Because I know where you're headed. Now, thank God if you're a faithful, loving member of the church and you do good. Now, that, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, you better be careful how you throw that around. Because Peter threw it around and said, Hey, I'll never fail you. I will lay down my life for thy sake. That's, a, that's, that's Peter all over, okay? Mm -hmm. So he says, Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down my life for my sake? Oh, you will? You will do that? Let me tell you something, Peter. Look what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. He said, you will deny him three times before the cock crows. Now, the cock crow was a specific time in, in, in Jesus' day. It was from about 12 o'clock to about 5 o'clock. Uh, generally, that, that was called the cock crow. That's what they called it. Now, I think he's just saying, before the morning comes, Peter, you will deny me that you even know me three times. And that's quite a contrast from I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere you want to go. I'll forsake my whole life for you. I'll, I'll die for you, he said. And then Jesus said, Pete, Jesus said no, I, I know what's going to happen. You're going to, before the morning comes, you're going to deny me three times. Lowest point in Peter's life. Let me real quickly. we got about five minutes here. Hey, I don't like really any like you got to win any time. You can always turn it off. But you don't because you're going to miss it. It's getting good. Jesus, this, and this, may, this obviously is not a comprehensive list. And I don't do this to pick on Peter, okay? This is not pick on Peter now, okay? It's just simply to show that we all fail, we all falter, and as great as Peter was as a, as a child of God, I mean, folks, let me tell you something. This is the same Peter that makes all these mistakes is the same Peter that preached on Pentecost Day in 3006. I mean, the man came up. Once the Holy Spirit got a hold of him, 
Got to straighten down a little bit. But let me share with you about, about 12 things real quickly. Mm -hmm. It's going to be real quick. I will give you the scripture reference. You can look it up. Here's the scripture reference uh, from the first one. First one, uh, Peter questions, uh, well, how about that? Here, Matthew 15 and 16. I'm going to combine these. Peter and some of the other disciples, not all. It doesn't mean that they are all headed on, you know, never failed. They messed up too. But in Matthew 15 and 16, they all misunderstood the parables about the soul and the limb. Okay? And that's normal. We're not picking on them to say they did anything bad. I'm just saying it shows their level of maturity. You know where he said, my little children? No wonder he could look at them as little children. Because they were kind of baggy, fussy, you know, make it all about me. I'll do this and I'll do that. Little children now. Kind of guy. And we all do that. So Matthew 15, 16, they all misunderstood the parables of the soul and the leaven. Uh, Mark 10, 13. Uh, the, Peter and some of the other disciples will not allow children and babies to be brought to Jesus. Anything that Jesus had to correct them on shows they were out of step. Either was, he was saying, you're not in time with what God's wanting to do. You're not in the will of God, what God's wanting to do. You don't understand. One, parent, one time he said, uh, one time they wanted to call fire down on some people that were preaching, but they weren't part of the disciples. Our group, you know, our group. <laughs> they wanted to call fire down on them, burn them up. Jesus said, you have no idea what kind of spirit you're operating in. He said, you know, there's something in your heart. It's just going the wrong direction. So anyway, Mark 10, 13, they wouldn't allow them, the babies and Jesus, uh, babies to come to Jesus. And he said, some of those children come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of them. Matthew 14, 22. Matthew 14, 22. Peter 6. Now this is probably one of Peter's most famous things other than his denial. He gets out of the boat, begins to walk on the water, and then he begins to sink. And you know, we got to give Peter credit. At least he got out of the boat. There was 11 other sitting over there saying, what? <laughs> did they miss the opportunity? But he did take his eye off and begin to sink. So it just shows that Peter's not 100%, but he sinks in the water. That's Matthew 14, 22. Mark chapter 9 and 10 and Luke 11. Peter argues with the other disciples about who's the greatest. Okay, so the other disciples were involved too. But here's Peter. We've talked about this before. You know, I want to sit beside Jesus when he came to come. I want to be sitting in the big chair at the big table. And then in Matthew 17, 4 and Mark 9, 5, he wants to build three tabernacles. Jesus takes him up, affords him a wonderful opportunity to go up on the mount. And man, what's happening? Who all is at this transfiguration? Jesus? Holy Spirit? God the Father? Huh? Moses? Elijah? And what does what does Peter say? Peter said, Well, I've been sitting over here and here's here we're worshiping, and man, all that's happened. I gotta say something stupid. <laughs> so he says, Man, this is, he said, Jesus, this is great. Let's build three tabernacles. What was the tabernacle for? That was the housing for God. Well, I got news for you. There wasn't one God on that mountain. Moses and Elijah didn't need a tabernacle. And he had to be corrected on it. Now, like I say, I'm not, I'm not beating on him. I probably made the same dumb mistake. But he said, let's, let's, let's build three tabernacles here. And not, you know, you ever talk about, well, I got reprimanded. Well, who reprimanded him that night? The Father. The voice came down. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He said, there's only one here worth worshiping. There's only one here worth being on the tabernacle, said Peter. Get your mind right. Yep. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, 17, Matthew 17, 24. Peter, uh, they come to him about, they come to Peter uh, and ask, ask if Jesus is going to pay his taxes, and Peter goes ahead and makes an, uh, answers him and kind of sets him where he's going to be, but it ain't the right thing. Mm -hmm. So he kind of jumps ahead of Jesus there. We'll give him credit on that, at least. I mean, he was there. Matthew 17, 24. Then Luke 4, 8, another one. Peter, this, this one, this is a biggie here. If he was really out of the will of God and really off base here, 
ever in his life. This was it. Uh, Luke 4, 8. Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to come, I'm going to die on the cross, be betrayed to me, die on the cross, buried, rose again, third day, the whole thing. Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. He said, basically saying, well, there ain't no way. I'm not going to allow that. What did Jesus, the strongest rebuke Jesus ever gave Peter was what? Get thee behind me, Satan. I don't necessarily believe that means Satan had entered Peter. I just simply, what I think Jesus was saying was that just like Satan doesn't want the will of the Father done, you have taken that position too. And you're, you're really off base here. Then the next one, John 13, 8. Peter refuses to let Jesus wash his feet. We've seen that in a couple weeks ago, didn't we? Huh. You ain't gonna wash my feet. Wait a minute, you're talking to God here. You're talking to Jesus Christ. You're the one that said, I believe thou Christ, the Son of the living God, save the word. And he said, Well, you're not gonna, you know, you say you're gonna wash my feet, you ain't gonna wash my feet. So Peter, Peter, like I say, he just he he's he's impetuous. Peter is is natural man. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a man that has a, a, a lusty carnality about him. You know, I'm going to do my own thing, do my own way. I'm trying to work with you, God, here, but you got to work with me, you know. Peter, Peter's, he's just, he's just got a lot of self in him. So he says, you're not going to wash my feet. And then number nine, Matthew 26, 40, Peter and the other disciples fall asleep instead of praying. You know, they go out into the garden and Jesus says, watch and pray. Twice he says, watch and pray. He comes back a third time. They're all asleep. And he said, what? Did you not pray with me for just an hour? Just an hour. I know they were tired. And I, I'm guilty of this. Just an hour. I'm just too tired to serve the Lord today. And, you know, we, we need to understand that we need to be there when he needs us. Matthew, next one. Matthew 26, 74. Jesus did not, uh, Peter denies Jesus with curses and swears. This is when he, he goes and follows Jesus in the temple. And he swears three times. And he begins to curse. That's why we need to understand Christian person. Or even unsaved person. Why? You know, we're talking about, well, you shouldn't say bad words. That was the way Peter, I, I believe it was a conscious, willful effort on Peter's part to distance himself from Jesus Christ. By saying, if I curse, they don't know They'll think, man, this guy can't be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Remember that the next time you're tempted or you get, and I know it's easy to do, but you get in a big way and talking to somebody or you get mad and angry and you say something you shouldn't, it can misidentify you as to who you are. Then John 21, Peter discouraged himself and he goes back fishing. After he failed and denied Jesus instead of Believing and believing and trusting the Lord's forgiveness. Hadn't the Lord forgave him and forgave a lot of people? So he said, I'm just going to go back fishing. I go fishing. So, and then later on, after the resurrection and the Holy Spirit comes, Galatians 2 11, Peter separates himself purposely from Gentile believers when certain Jewish believers come from Jerusalem to avoid conflict. You can read about that in Galatians 2. But let me tell you something. I mentioned something. We'll be done with this. I know we, we're time to be done. Matthew 26, 54, 52 through 54. When Jesus said in the garden, I mentioned to you, and I'm going to tell you, I don't, know, I don't lie to you. Uh, when, he told Je when he told Peter, don't you know that I can call six legions of angels? So six legions, 12,000 is a legion. So he says, Peter, don't you understand I can call 72,000 angels? Now, angels are different than human beings. We can, we can gather by the Word of God and some of the things that are said. I don't know what they look like, but they strike fear in people. Because every time anybody ever seen one, they had to say, fear not. Yeah. It's something scary about them. I don't know if they're 25 feet tall. I'm not going into that. I'm just saying there's something scary about them. But I know this, and this is biblical. Okay? This is biblical. I got the scripture wrote down here somewhere if I can find it. It happened in the Old Testament that an angel came, oh, an angel came down and fought the Assyrian army one night. 
I'm going to have to get that uh, scripture out. I've got it wrote down here. I thought I did, but I didn't. And an angel comes down and kills one angel one night. Kills 185,000 Assyrians. One angel. Whoa. So if one angel in 12 hours can kill 185,000 Assyrians, 12 legions, or 6 legions, which is 72,000, could kill 13 billion in one 12 hour period. No, I don't know. I'm just, that folks, let me tell you something. Jesus said, listen. And, and the whole idea of that was, they're not taking me because I don't, they're not taking me with the idea that I won't be taken. That I, that I'm not going down the cross because they make me. I'm doing it willfully because I can call 72,000 angels that could kill 13 billion people in 12 hours. That lets us know for sure Jesus was doing it of his own free will. That's what was going on in the upper room. Some powerful things happening in the upper room. Now, we'll still be in the upper room next week, getting into John 14, 15, 16, 17. Four chapters, one sermon. And we're going to look at that sermon because it is, I believe it's the greatest sermon that has ever preached by anybody in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. Keep praying. Keep looking up. We'll let you know of any changes about our service. And thank you for joining us. God bless you. I love you.